But remember, this changes every single day. So the order and the actual squares are slightly different. As soon as you get five in a row, horizontal, vertical, or diagonal, send a message to Grace. Remember, Christina is not here. She is teaching today. It's also her birthday. Great. Um, send a message to Grace if you get a bingo and she will explain to you what you have won the right to do. So take a screenshot of this if you need to. That is our bingo board of the day. Our dinosaur of the day is the following. Bam, ba, da, da. Camptosaurus. I forgot to write its name on top. It's C-A-M-P, like go to camp. T-O, Saurus. Camp to Saurus. Camptosaurus. So this is Camptosaurus right here. Its name means flexible hand. It's an ornithopod, so it's somewhat closely related to um, di hadrosaurs, dinosaurs like Edmontosaurus, Parasaurolophus, that type of thing. Cool feature on these guys is they have this weird triangular head that ends with a like a snout and a beak, which is pretty cool. They were medium size. We don't show this often, but a lot of times when you look up sizes for dinosaurs, they usually will go with like the largest upper limit of the dino just because, I don't know, it looks more impressive. So this is what maybe a large Camptosaurus would look like uh, compared to a human. And then the smaller, smaller range, maybe more average, a, a lot smaller. So somewhere between these two sizes for your Camptosaurus. I'm excited to see your drawings. I'm excited to see what you use for scale. So remember without something for scale, it's just not great science. I'm also excited to see what you name our friend, the Camptosaurus. Now, that is our dino of the day. That is our bingo of the day. And perhaps most importantly, our guest of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the executive director of the Montshire Museum of Science, Marcos Staffney. <laughs> Marcos, where are you zooming in from right now? White River Junction, Vermont. White River, which I, is near the Montshire. It is, it is, uh, which is normally in Norwich, Vermont, but um, is now diffused all, across all states of Vermont and New Hampshire right now. So it, uh, coming to you from Zoom rooms. Uh, most importantly, though, are you pancakes or waffles? 100% uh, waffles, uh, and uh, seeing some thumbs up there. Um, I, fun for people to know, much like someone who knows a lot about dinosaur toys, for my 41st birthday, I held a waffle party where I invited um, about 40 people to come in and make their own waffles, um, in which living in the state of Vermont, we have so much maple syrup uh, that uh, is uh, very expensive in probably all of your states, but in our state uh, is like a gift that you get instead of wine. Uh, so people bringing maple syrup. So we tasted all sorts of maple syrups uh, with some delicious waffles. So you are on the right side of history. That's good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's why we had you today. Marcos, you are no exception to every other guest bird, which means we start this by playing everyone's favorite game, dino or not a dino. I know you know how it works. Yeah. What is your level of confidence going in this morning? About 52%. 52%. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Let's... Better than that. All you have to do is get six out of 10, 60% in order to uh, remain on the Zoom. If you don't get 60% <laughs> immediately, I'm going to close this window because there's a garbage truck outside. All right, and, and everybody who else is on, I have moved my screen so I can see all of you. So I'm expecting thumbs up or thumbs downs uh, for, for these dinosaurs. Uh, if you are a smart participant because you know that the help from the Dino 101 Zoom is what's going to get you over that 60% hump. Yes. Here we go. This is the way it works. If you're not familiar, you should be familiar. All of you should be familiar at this point. I'm going to read Marcos the name of 10 different animals, some of which are actual real dinosaurs some of which I have totally made up. And your job, sir, is simply to let us know if you think it is a dinosaur or not a dinosaur. You know you can look around the Zoom room uh, polling the audience. That's usually relatively helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I should also mention that if you need it, I can spell any of these. You can request a spelling. As okay. well as there is a theme for the non-dinos. So you get bonus points and extra ad, uh, admiration if you can figure out the theme of the not-dinos. All right. All right. Without further ado, let's dig in dinosaur or not a dinosaur number one, Bandai Cephaly. Bandai Cephaly. Bandai Cephaly. Look how many people did not put it. Okay, I'm getting some no's, some yeses. Oh, man. Bandai Cephaly. Out to Megan's background. Um, I'm gonna say no. Uh, they get, I get more no's. I'm asking a friend, all the friends here. So is that a no? 
Is, no, is that your final answer? That's my final answer, yeah. That is correct. Off to a great start. Bandai said right. the dinosaur. One for one. Number two, Berberosaurus. Berberosaurus. Sounds like a high-end uh, uh, handbag. Um, I'm getting a lot of no's there. Berberosaurus. Um, I'm going to say no, no. That is not a dinosaur. You're spelling? You're just going no. No, no. You are incorrect. Berberosaurus is an actual dinosaur. B-E-R-B-E-R-O-saurus. Berberosaurus. Okay. All right. I had to make these a little bit harder because people have been crushing this. You're one for one. I'm sorry. You're one of two. Number three, Archaeo Fisher. Archaeo Fisher. R-K-O. Spell that for me. It's not R-K-O. It's <laughs> A-R-C-H-A-E-O. Archaeo Fisher. F-I-S-H-E-R. Archaeo Fisher. We've got a big thumbs up from Natty, who got 10 out of 10, but not a whole lot of other opinions going on right now. What do you guys think? I, the people don't know Archeo Fisher. Archeo Fisher. I'm going to say yes, just to expedite the game. So how about yes as a, as a dinosaur? Is that uh, a, a, how about no? How about it's not a dinosaur? Not, not a dinosaur. OK. <laughs> well, who are my friends who are on Google? Like, all of you should be on Google right now looking these up. That's, like, what? I, I'm not. No. But that's you know, that's not how it works. Have you have never played Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? All right. You're in the red right now, but there's plenty of time to come back. Uh, Diophilosaurus. Diophilosaurus. D Y. Yeah, D Y O P L O Saurus. Diophilosaurus. Hmm. Uh, Nodding. Thumbs up. So I'm going to say yes. Correct. Okay. Diophilosaurus is a dino. You're now two for two, 50%. Here we go. Number five, Legalong. Legolong. Say that's no, and I'm starting to sense a theme here of dinosaurs. Legolong? Uh, no, that is no, not a dinosaur. Correct. That is not a dinosaur. Now, three and two, back in the clear. Next, Frutidens. 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 Hmm. Can you use Frutidens in a sentence for me, please? Uh, sure. The next dinosaur you have to identify is Frutidens. <laughs> It's fruit, like F-R-U-I-T-A-D-E-N-S. Frutidens is one of the smallest dinosaurs ever discovered in North America. Did I just give it away? <laughs> OK, so clearly <laughs> Frutidens is a dinosaur. So yes. Uh, <laughs> horrible, horrible on my part. Yes, Frutidens is a dinosaur. Crap. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. OK, um, I feel like you're using mind control right now. All right, you're four and two. Uh-huh. Uh, Metellomimus. Uh, that is not a dinosaur. No. That is not a dinosaur. You're correct. Uh, that is now you have five correct, two wrong, doing pretty great. Next. This game Con. is endless. What is the next one? I'm sorry. Con. Con. K-H-A-N. K-H-A-A-N. Con. K-H-A-A-N. Wow, there's some uh, some virtual silence from people in the group here. Uh, let's see. Uh, K-H. Uh, Hmm. Thumbs. I'm gonna say thumbs up. So I see more of those. So I'll say yes. Is that a dinosaur? It is a dinosaur. Okay. On. You've got one, two, three, six right, two wrong. We're in the home stretch. We got two more. You've already passed. You got the sixty percent. Let's bump Great. that up. Let's bump that up to a B. Let's see what we can okay. do. Next, Medusa Ceratops. Medusa Ceratops. Medusa Ceratops. Where are my Ceratopian friends here? Uh, like, okay, we're getting, yeah, yes, it is a dinosaur. It is a dinosaur, Medusa Ceratops. Right. That is a dinosaur. Medusa Ceratops, very cool name. I like that. that one. Medusa Ceratops, you're seven and two. Last but not least, Proto Nerfinator. <laughs> That's going to be a no. Proto Nerfinator. I think I can. Nerfinator, that is not a dinosaur. You got, after a, a tough start, you bumped it up to eight out of 10, which is very good. For an extra bonus point, what was the theme of the not dinos? Toys. Toy companies. We had toy bandos. companies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what. Oh, Oreo. Uh, <laughs> not a dinosaur. Not a, a cat. Fisher, cool. Fisher Price. Not a dinosaur. Lego Long. Not a dino. Uh, Mattel Omimus. Not a dinosaur. And obviously Proto Nerf Anator. Not dinos. But I had to go with the toy theme because that's what we are talking about today. So 
Um, before we jump right into that, or at least before we jump into that with you, Marcos, I want to say a quick bit about why I appreciate and love dinosaur toys. Like, I don't have a bunch of my own, like, figures, like Marcos is going to show us in a minute. But there is one particular very small dino toy that is near and dear to my heart, and it is this pile of them right here. So you can find these on eBay for, it's a pack of like 72 for I think like eight, nine dollars. And they're obviously they're really small. Um, and I use these, here's the whole fam. <laughs> I use these during my tours at the American Museum of Natural History. And this was kind of almost an accident at the beginning, but I wanted to give people a little bit more of an interactive, like agency granting activity during the tour, rather than kind of just talking at people. And so after we've done this tour for about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, we go into the last fossil hall uh, at the American Museum of Natural History, which is a bingo square. Bingo square. Uh, and before we enter the last hall, I tell everyone, in order to get their totally legit degree as a dinosaur scientist, they have to go on a fossil hunt. So I hand everyone in the group one of these tiny toy dinos, these guys right here, and I give them three objectives. So the ones I give them, all of those actual tiny toys are in the next fossil hall represented by the actual giant large fossilized skeleton. So I give them one of these and they're given three objectives. One, they have to find their dinosaur. So find the one represented by their toy in the hall. It's a fossil hunt, obviously you gotta find it. Two, uh, in order to prove they found it, they must take a dino selfie, which is patently ridiculous, but pretty hard to pull off, right? These are large animals, it's hard to take a selfie with them. And last but not least, learn one thing about it. It can be as simple as what its name is. Right, and I really like doing this activity because even though these things literally cost like a dime and are such a tiny little keepsake, it ties people to the experience in a way that just talking about it or even telling them what dinosaur theirs is couldn't happen. And so people go out into the hall and again, instead of me just telling them about the stuff in there, they've taken ownership over their own learning and exploration and people come back with amazingly cute photos. You can see one, actually, if you zoom in real close, I know you can't do that, I can. In his hand, there's a little yellow Camptosaurus, our dino of the day. People come back with amazing dino selfies, Camptosaurus, Euplocephaly, Parasaurolophus, Stegosaurus. And it gives people physical ownership over learning and over a space that wouldn't otherwise happen. Now, because they become the expert. They come back and they share out their dino selfie, they share out what they found, and they get to keep that and take it home. And even though it is a two inch vinyl toy that costs like 15 cents, it ties people to the experience and gives them a little more ownership and agency in a way that just talking about it can't. And I didn't really think about the psychology behind doing this before I did it, but as I started doing it, I realized how useful and beneficial this was and how much people love those toys. And so if you have ever come on a tour with me at the American Museum of Natural History, if you've ever seen me at a museum conference, I have put one of these in your hand and people send me pictures of them at their offices, when they're traveling the world, wherever they put their dinosaur all the time. And it's such a fun little keepsake and remembrance that keeps the learning uh, and the memory of that experience going. I know a lot of that has to do with the psychology behind the toys. And that is exactly why I wanted to have Marcos on today because he knows a little bit more than I do about the history and the psychology behind dinosaur toys. If you wanna follow Marcus, this is his, uh, his handle both on Twitter and on Instagram. You can also follow at Monshire. It's the Monshire Museum of Science. Um, but without further ado, Marcos, you're the one who's here to be our guest for it. Sir, my first question for you before we even get into your presentation, as it were, why, why dinosaurs? Not toys specifically, why dinosaurs? You're a big dino nerd. That's one of the ways that we bonded. Before we get to the toys, why dinosaurs in the first place? Yeah. Um... I like like probably everybody on this uh, call right now have always been interested in dinosaurs. I think uh, for me, I, my home science center where I grew up did not have a ton of science centers. I grew up in Orlando, Florida, um, and so we went to the Orlando Science Center. And at that time, it now has a giant dinosaur hall, but it didn't. But it did have dinosaur erasers. Um, so I'm, I'm holding up. So Dustin showed you one type of molded plastic dinosaur that he uses um, uh, that come in sets. But yeah, I think we're all familiar with, sorry, this is, uh, I don't have like a, a steady cam here, but you can see like, this is like the sort of classic set of dinosaur erasers that um, I used to see as a child and you can still buy these in our museum store and hundreds of museum stores. Um, it's the Stegosaurus, uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, the Metrodon, uh, 
Triceratops and Pteranodon, um, set or pterodactyl, depending on what you want to call this guy. Um, we all see these. And when I was a kid, I would go to the science center with my dad and I didn't get to see him a whole lot growing up. So it was a special occasion. And every time we would go to the science center, I would get a singular dinosaur eraser um, as like the present for you know going to the science center. And it was my keepsake of that experience. So for me, uh, dinosaurs just became something that I, I liked because it was a collectible. But then also the time period in which I was born, there was just a lot of dinosaur content and dinosaur stuff around that helped me to construct an identity of somebody who just loves dinosaurs. Now, like many of you, I, I like dinosaurs a little more than a regular person. So I did try or think about becoming a paleontologist for a while until I studied paleontology um, like for real, like on site somewhere and realized that that was not the kind of science for me. Um, to like dive deep into, um, but that said, I still love it and have worked in science communication ever since and love talking about dinosaurs and the on wonder that they, that they instill in everybody. So that's a good segue. Speaking of odd wonder being instilled, I'm going to start the presentation you sent me. I'm really excited because this is, a, again, something I don't know a ton about. I don't even know if I can pronounce this word, Marcus, so I'm going to let you take it away. So, uh, so I'm a scientist. Like I'm a, I am a uh, social scientist who practices something called phenomenology. Or um, so I like to think of myself as a phenomenologist. And a phenomenologist, which is a little alternative to a paleontologist, uh, is someone who studies lived experiences or um, like your experience. I have a really big interest in what your life experience is like. How did you grow up? Like what types of things did you like growing up? And as I talk to more and more people about that experience, I get a shared grouping of those particular experiences. Now I use that to help inform rules and policy um, for, for large groups. So, uh, but it's a qualitative research method. So it means that I'm talking to people individually. I like to talk to people and um, as opposed to talking to like a bone every day. So that's uh, something that made me move from paleontology to phenomenology. Uh, and so uh, in that, I like to clump together people's shared experiences. And toys is something we all sort of share an experience with. Um, one of the ways that I started to think more about toys was working for the Brooklyn Children's Museum, which had a collection of about 30,000 objects of which a ton of them were historical toys. So I got to learn a lot about toys and our shared experiences of playing with toys throughout time. Cool. So, you want to just next slide, please, Dustin. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you. <laughs> so, so it, uh, Dustin talked about a little bit about the psychology or like how we start to identify or think about toys. And so I put a couple of slides together. Um, that yellow circle in the center was a smiley face. If you can't see it too big, and that represents you. So if you're going to walk into a toy store in general, and we've all done it, we've seen toys that we have no reaction to, right? So like, you're like, hmm, there's a, a American Girl doll, a dinosaur, and a pack of Legos. And if I've never seen any one of those things, I, I may not care at all about um, one of those items, Legos, an American Girl doll, or a dinosaur toy. But if we've had an experience, then we can start to mark that experience with a memento, like a toy. So for example, if we go to the American Museum of Natural History or any of your natural history museums and see a Triceratops, um, then when I go to the museum store, I might wanna get a you know, Triceratops eraser to help mark that experience. I've become more familiar with that particular experience with that dinosaur by marking it with a memento. Now, uh, we can go to the next one. Um, now, sometimes I get those experiences with dinosaurs or dinosaur toys from going to a museum, but most of the time, for the majority of people, we're getting those experiences from popular culture or media. So I put up an image of The Land Before Time because this was a really popular movie when I was a kid. I must have been eight or nine years old when this movie came out, the original one. There have been, I think, um, 425 sequels to Land Before Time now. So lots of kids on this call might have seen a more recent work version of that. 
But in this one, sometime in the 80s, there was a movie about dinosaurs, so I was a nut for it, and there was a character named Sarah, who Kirk Kors is a Ceratopian, a uh, baby Triceratops, and then do you see the toy that's next to it? This was a toy that actually was a rubber puppet that you could get from a Hardee's. Now, not everybody in the country knows what a Hardee's is, but in Florida, where I grew up, that's sort of like a, a like a Arby's or a like roast beef shack, like that you would go and get a roast beef sandwich. And if I went every week, I would get a new toy or a new dinosaur. Um, and so Sarah became sort of for me a prototypical idea of what a ceratopian or a trice baby triceratops would be. She was real spunky and fun. Um, so the toy represented my understanding of that movie because I didn't actually have a giant triceratops in my local museum to see. You go to the next one. So as a human, as I start to build an identity about myself and why I like dinosaurs, there are lots of different ways that we can start to associate our toys with our memories. So again, it's either it's once I finally saw a real Triceratops um, uh, model, like in a museum, the movie, different types of toys that started to exist in my worldview, which then leads to like uh, expanded interest in dinosaurs by seeing the movie Jurassic Park. That's the famous Triceratops that's, you know, not feeling so great in the movie. Uh, so it all helps to construct an identity in myself as someone who loves dinosaurs. And those toys help to magnify that. They keep those things present in my, in my life. So one more slide here, uh, and then we can get to some fun dinosaur images of other toys. So I am just one person who has had these experiences, but we have all had these experiences. So we share a common culture around this both popular media and museums. And then those influence the toys or the type of toys that we might have. So those toys become mementos, but they're also a part of our identity. So like I might identify myself with a triceratops in, in a certain way, it becomes a favorite dinosaur because I've been exposed to so many different types of triceratopses, either through TV or through the movies or you know, from museum visits. And then we further exemplify, you know, this toy by learning more about it, by getting a book, by getting multiple types of triceratopses. Um, so this is how we start to develop collections of things or collections of items. So that's just a little bit about how we start to construct and identify ourselves with these toys um, and how like media really influences and in the history of toys, media like TV and movies and comic books, they, they are directly tied to the type of toy that you're gonna buy in a toy store or a museum store. Absolutely, so quick sidebar, I'm just curious to know, I'm just launching a poll now, who here in the room has actually seen The Land Before Time? So I think most of us have, but Marcos, you just reminded me, it is relatively an old movie at this point, so I'm, I'm just curious to know who has, most of us have, if you've not seen it, you should probably go, no, go to the movie theater. It's not at the movie theater. No, but but The Land Before Time just ha has had a, like no less than I think seven sequels and a lot of direct to video. So it is a familiar what we would call property. So when we start to have things like the Flintstones or the uh, Land Before Time that, that has its own unique identifier, we call that like in an industry a property. Um, and so uh, in that it has had mass maximum exposure. There are still like contemporary Land Before Time toys made today. Mm -hmm. It looks like about 80% of us have seen a land before time. Yeah. Makes sense for this room. Cool. All right. Yeah. I'm excited to get through, get into some of these other ones. I'm just going to advance the slide here. These are, these are starting to look a little bit weird. We had a day all about paleo art and how paleo artists have to use scant fossil evidence to try to piece together what this thing may have looked like, what color, what shape, what size. And then you take that a step further into a toy and you start to get some interesting looking guys like these. Right, so a popular toy pro, uh, company that when you say the history of toys, the Marks Toys Company is um, one of the first groups that started mass producing toys um, for general consumption. And so again, people are like, where are these dinosaurs? Like, what are dinosaurs? You have to think in the 50s, did everybody know what a dinosaur was? Well, we didn't all have the internet, so you didn't have like, you know, if you weren't really being schooled in dinosaurs or have a museum that had dinosaur displays, um, 
they there were very few media that were related to it so people's imaginations were able to sort of explode i love this like red-headed uh <laughs> like uh yellow-bodied dinosaur uh i guess tyrannosaurus rex um i have no clue i've never seen one of these in person but it was like a fun find um to, to see and then you've got this sort of uh, to the left of it a little bit more of a uh, classic molded uh plasticine dinosaur that uh, a lot of us have probably had experience with plasticine not to be confused with pleistocene yes yes a plastic product i should just say yeah, yeah or a, a soft wax I mean, it might be a wax product yeah uh okay i'm gonna keep going i love i love yeah. the arc that we're going through keep going so Mark's toys um, developed something called playset. So if you collect toys, uh, playset is like when you get um, an environment, the characters in which to like play in the environment, kind of like a dollhouse with dolls, but like that can be a really unpopular term back in the 50s for um, all, uh, all kids to want to play with. So they would have this thing called a playset, uh, which had lots of figurines that you would move around. So the Flintstones, I, I like to think of like in looking at the research of like how did dinosaur toys really hit the popular market, the Flintstones premiered in the 60s, 1960, and from there a whole line of products launched. Now the Flintstones, you know, for some of our younger viewers may not uh, have as deep a relationship with the Flintstones. This was on repeat as something I would watch in the afternoons constantly uh, when I was a kid. Um, had some really popular dinosaurs like Dino the dinosaur. It also had a pterodactyl, a Tronodon that was always um, like telling people the time. Um, but so Dino like starts to influence like, okay, well, there are dinosaurs. Now Flintstone's horribly inaccurate, of course, when it comes to paleontology, because like even in the place that you have a cyber tooth tiger and, a, uh, and who, who know, even knows what kind of dinosaur Dino is? That's a good question in the chat. Like, I, um, I'm not quite sure. You know what's... Uh, if you think you have a guess of the species of dino here, which is Fred's pet, uh, drop that in the chat. And Grace can read us off some uh, species guesses. I like that. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is the early 60s. So these are th this place that's coming out like right when the television show is coming. And then if you go to the next slide, we see some, you know, more traditional sort of 60s toys. Um, that came out of the 1964 World's Fair. So um, Sinclair is a, a oil company and they did a lot of work around fossil fuels and what are fossils and understanding that. So the 1964 World's Fair, there are these things um, called World's Fairs, World Expos. They actually still happen. I've gone to four of them. Um, and I used to work on the side, Dustin, too, at, at the 1964 World's Fair at the New York Hall of Science. So right around the corner from the New York Hall of Science, there used to be a ride that you would go on and you would visit uh, animatronic dinosaurs. And then as a um, memento of your experience, you would get a uh, wax injected dinosaur. So many of us still see these machines where you like pour hot wax into a dye mold and then you get a memento. So I, I actually have one. I have a one from 1964 right here. So it's something that I, I have collected. Um, now this is, I would like to say, a memento. It's not necessarily a good toy, um, but it is something that helps us to like say, okay, well then maybe if I have this, I would want to get something. This is not the same dinosaur. I think this is meant to be a Brontosaurus, um, you know, uh, from 1960s. And I believe this is a Brachiosaurus. Um, that is a Schleich toy that I think I got within the last three years. This is a better toy. I can handle it. It's uh, tough. Um, you know, you can move it around. Um, you can use it as a paperweight. It's got a lot of different uses. Um, I can role play with it if I want to have another dinosaur um, fighting. You know, this would never happen, right? Like a, a Triceratops fighting a Brachiosaurus. Uh, would it happen? I don't know. Like you guys correct me on that one. Same. Quite the same. I know, I know, right? So, so there, but you know, like I can make them fight. I can, I can have them, you know, go to lunch together. I can have them do all sorts of things. Um, but this is a better toy, whereas these wax things were more mementos that you would put up on a shelf and look at because if I were to play with this, I would destroy it. Now, as a sensory experience, I might want to do that. If anyone has ever gotten one of these wax um, molded dinosaurs fresh, and you can still do that in a lot of museums. Um, you can press it, you can touch it, um, you can destroy it. It feels so good to do it, you know. Um, the smell is amazing of these, the Moldorama ones. 
Yeah, yeah. So here are a couple of examples and you can start to see, so people would collect these, but it helps to like engender like the experience of like wanting to have more types of dinosaur toys out there. And these are the first things that were available. The playset ones were a lot smaller. Um, hard plastic ones are coming around the same times, like the ones that Dustin showed you that he uses with his, um, his tours. Quick sidebar on these. So if you guys look carefully at the T-Rex and the uh, Brontosaurus here, you can see on the bottom, it actually says Field Museum Chicago. So if you go to the field, and then the top, the Triceratops says Sinclair Dino Lands. So that might be from the original. But if you go to the Field Museum in Chicago, where Sue the T-Rex is, that's a bingo square. Um, <laughs> uh, they have, I think, five or six. They're called Moldo Ramas. And you can buy one of these. They're relatively cheap still to this day. And I love that it's such a throwback and the smell, you see the mold coming down, you see the wax being poured. It's a very sensory experience. One other thing I just want to mention real quick, I love that we, we talked about Sinclair hair. People are always like, oh, oil is made out of dead dinosaurs. So the majority of oil is made out of decaying organic matter, which is microorganisms, algae, and plant matter. So saying oil is made out of dinosaurs is kind of like saying uh, your notebook is made out of beetles because there was one on the tree they cut down to make the paper. Just throwing that out there. Um, also, Marcos, I grabbed a couple photos of that original World's Fair because oh. I, both of us used to work at, not at the same time, but both of us used to work at the New York Hall of Science out in Flushing Meadows. So here's one. Um, you may, in the back here above the neck of the brontosaurus, you can see part of the globe, that giant iconic globe that is still out there. I would have loved to actually see this, but I was not alive yet. So uh, for a while, and I don't know if you still can, a lot of those dinosaurs, they traveled over to Disneyland. Disney was the one who produced uh, that ride. And so they moved to Disneyland. And uh, if you ride the Mickey Express, it would take you into um, a tunnel that had those dinosaurs. So I was able to see those. Um, there's a good little documentary when you were super nerd uh, about Disney rides uh, that you can watch about how those, how those dinosaurs moved back to California. Cool. So moving forward into, well, not the future, but a little bit farther uh, in the future. Let's see, let me share the screen. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I'm skipping 20 years. Yeah. Uh, so you know why? Because like there wasn't a whole lot of like, high, there, there were some dinosaur, uh, dinosaurs featured in like uh some like kids entertainment but this is really like hitting my like love of dinosaurs which are dinobots of course uh from you know some autobots from the transformer series uh dustin asked me like oh but like well kids of today know what a dinobot is and, and again when something is popular or a property is popular like transformers there are so many different generations so there are like, I think we're like on um, generation 10 of like Transformers where Dinobots have like had their own show now, like within the last 10 years, they're, 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 you can go buy a Dinobot today, I think. But these are the classic toys, I would say. And I tried, it was a little hard to find like a set of them. I definitely had the Stegosaurus growing up. Um, and here's a good example of something that, again, was meant to be played with, but was better as a memento piece or a show piece. These were horrible toys. So if you think that, you know, if any of the kids out there have gotten a Dinobot today, they're a higher quality toy. They sort of look more like the robot and the, the actual object. So when you transformed the uh, Stegosaurus, the Triceratops, into a robot, it did not look like the cartoon nor was an easy thing to do and the plastic broke all the time so it, it wasn't the easiest um or, or the best toy but i definitely like really valued that uh stegosaurus that i had for a long time uh these particular toys in this property like painted dinosaurs is these sort of idiotic stupid um things and so i think that that uh from an 80s perspective like kept people in the minds that like dinosaurs are dumb and they're stupid um, so I, I don't love uh, Dinobots now, like thinking about them. They were always sort of like the less than and the other like Autobots and Decepticons. Um, and so like that would affect, or affect, excuse me, role play. So like when you're actually like playing with these dinosaurs, which are ultimately like thinking about playing with a figurine or a doll, like you would cast or sort of make yourself that way as you were playing with these particular toys. So it's, it's something to think about like when purchasing a toy. What about this next, ooh, 
I love these. Oh, these dinosaurs. This is the best theme song of any dinosaur show. So, dinosaurs, you can watch a couple of episodes on YouTube. Highly recommend it. What's the name, um, what's the name what's of that? Dino Saucer. Dino Saucer, like, you know, like a flying saucer. Dino Saucers. Da, 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 da. Um, so, this was like, for like a diehard, so like if you like Transformers in the 80s, like you were cool, but if you also watched GoBots, that was like a, like a, a deep dive into transforming robots. GoBots actually think we're a better toy than a Transformer. Uh, dinosaurs again, are um, sort of a warring faction of dinosaurs where there are the good dinosaurs and the bad dinosaurs. And they didn't, you know, divide up by like meat eaters and non-meat eaters. Uh, pitted against two leaders, uh, a Tyrannosaurus Rex and an Allosaurus. Um, and Allo was like, you know, the good leader. And they would actually be able to transform themselves into their dinosaur, like, catapult. So they're humanoid um, for most of the show. And then they turned into dinosaurs. So the toys, I, I, I was actually, like, interested in seeing the toys. These were expensive toys. They were, so I remember them as a kid, so I never had one. Uh, they're in the same product line as He-Man, and so they, they were very similar to a He-Man toy, um, but uh, they were a little pricier, harder to find, and again, for a diehard fan, like a dinosaur show is a, is a cool one to watch. I love these. I love these. All right, we got to, let's pick up the pace slightly. Yep. I know there's going to be a lot of questions. Look at this chubby, thick boy. Oh, Tycho Dino Riders. So Dino Riders were like these, like, why not weaponize a dinosaur? You know, dinosaurs aren't mean enough or are, aren't fierce enough. Let's put some lasers on them. Lasers. I, I picked this one because I actually had this uh, Stegosaurus. I love this Stegosaurus because it had movable plates. And that was really gratifying to me yeah. because I had learned in a book about movable plates, you know, from my love of other TV shows. And compared to like the Transformer Stegosaurus, which you could barely move anything, you could like just keep moving the place and feeling it. It's so good. Marcos, uh, quick pop quiz. What are the name of the spikes on the end of the Stegosaurus's tail? Spikes? Does anyone, I know you guys in the chat, if you remember what the name of those spikes are on the end of the Stegosaurus tail, drop that in the chat. Grace, you can shout out whoever gets it right. Second question, uh, Marcos, do you know what laser is an acronym for? Oh my gosh, the New York College of Science is going to email me after this because it's, yes, yeah, something I, I did at one point in my life know it, but I've had to remove that information from my brain to make room for other information. Exactly. I'm sorry, I'm giving you the tough questions. I just love that laser's an acronym. I see that Martin remembers the spikes are called phagomizers. Every, I, we ha like everyone responded immediately. Also, shout out to Justin for teaching me recently that laser is an acronym. Uh, Mar Marcos, thank you for, for pretending you didn't know it was Thagomizer so everyone else could get it right. Um, <laughs> laser stands for light amplification via stimulated emissions of radiation. Light amplification, stimulated emissions of radiation. Uh, that's almost as good as SCUBA, which is self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. I love acronyms. Anyway, uh, all right, we got, uh-oh, uh -oh. this one is going to be polarizing. A little bit of contentious dinosaur some might not even call it a dino. Here we go, Marcos. What's the deal? I know. So I included, bar oh my God, I saw some like giant Grace, eyes popping Grace up. Walked out. <laughs> I know. Uh, so Barney is important to think about as a property and like people's first access to dinosaurs. I, I, I have much younger brothers and sisters and I have a, um, a brother who was growing up and was about five or six when Barney came out. I was uh, 14 years older than him. And so Barney was always on in the background and it started to make me think of other 90s dinosaurs, like dinosaurs of the 1990s and early 2000s. Barney plays a significant cultural um, role of forming people's understanding about dinosaurs because it meant that many people had a dinosaur in their house. Um, whether, you know, they had like these, uh, I don't remember what the other two names of the dinosaurs are, the green one or the yellow one there. Uh, that sounds like a good uh, pop quiz question for some folks out there. Uh, but um, Barney, again, is a property, meaning that um, there were, there was a television show, here's a toy, you know, toy. There were live Barney shows that traveled all across the country. I don't know if Barney is still popular today, but um, again, it's someone's first introduction to a dinosaur and it makes people love a dinosaur it's a dinosaur who teaches us and that's still happening today with other properties or other shows uh 
quick check in with my friend John here. Hey, John. Uh, I don't really care about the progress on your window or door. I just want to know, as a parent, and you hang out with other parents with kids that have grown up over the past decade, is Barney still like a relatively popular character? Uh, for fortunately, I uh, kept Barney away from my children early on. I'm not asking and, about uh, <laughs> No, I, I have not. Um, I've got a 12 year old and eight year old now, so it's been a while, but Barney kind of uh, fell by the wayside as far as other cartoons and and uh young adult young child uh television shows that's probably fair and maybe maybe marcus it's because uh we got stuff like this now yeah so dinosaur train like um i mean it's a, a pbs property so you know it's it's edutainment it's like something that's meant to make you learn as well mostly about social emotional learning i feel um so the dinosaur train has like i mean take a look at all the different toys one might buy right like the more characters we have the more toys we can buy uh, and there's so many different ones down there I, i'm not as familiar with dinosaur train but you know i love a train i do like i'm going to be that guy who has trains in his basement um uh so the the idea of like dinosaurs and a train like like what a genius idea like that that, that is like the hottest property i could ever have come up with um and so like this is I think uh, super popular. There are so many ways to purchase different types of mementos or, or, or products from Dinosaur Train. Is just even looking on Amazon, it's like pages and pages of Dinosaur Train stuff. Cool. So I know we are going to thank, first of all, Marcos, thank you. I just learned a ton about the history of Dino Toys. Uh, I'm a little frustrated that I personally am now stuck. So, I mean, I'm happy to be in Ohio in a great spot here, but like all my dinosaur toys and paraphernalia, including some ones that my uncle gave me from like the 50s, are all in my apartment in New York. So I couldn't share them with you today. So I'm glad I had an expert with a bunch to share with us. And I know our dino Zoom uh, room has some questions for you as the expert. So Grace, I'm going to hand it over to you. What questions do we have for Marcos about dinosaur toys, his love for dinos, the Monshire? Hit us. So Marcos, could you talk a little bit about... Um the evolution of dinosaur toys. Um, I work at AM &H and we just had an exhibition on T-Rex and we had to get in a lot more, more scientifically accurate toys versus the super unscientific accurate ones we had. So some people in the chat wanted to know, you know, when did museums or toy manufacturers start to have more scientifically accurate toys? Um, yeah. Um, you know, I think that that's a condition of like, like scientifically accurate is always going to be, you know, like, more, do we more have pictures? Where, what, what, where's the proof, right? You know, like, of like what they look like. So, you know, here's a Schleich dinosaur. So Schleich is a, a company that produces um, dinosaurs. This is my favorite uh, T-Rex. It's not, again, no feathers, no any of those, you know, things that we might have from the last, I saw that exhibition at AM and um, but it has an opposable, it has a jaw, at least that you can move up and down. Um, and again, it's a sturdy, different thing. Here's another version of a Schleich T-Rex, um, it's a much smaller one. Um, I mean, you can see it, but you know, for different sizes. And I would say that Jurassic Park, uh, if we want to think about that as a movie made in the mid nineties, started to sort of influence like how uh, mass produced dinosaurs uh, for her toys and mementos uh, started affecting. Now, uh, Hasbro and Tyco both had some more realistic looking dinosaur toys in the 80s, uh, just because like, pr like mass manufacturing made it easier to make more realistic looking dinosaurs with opposable parts and, oppos and, I, and I did not include like all of the dinosaur toys I had in the 80s. And that's why I showed that Stegosaurus from uh, dino, uh, dino Riders was because I just liked the fact that it had movable, um, movable plates um, on, on its back. So I would say like in the 80s and 90s, we start to see, especially in the 90s with Jurassic Park coming out, um, more realistic looking dinosaurs that you can play with. There's always been figurines that have been more realistic. You can't play with those. Right. So, right. so we are getting um, a lot of questions, but most of my questions right now are that people want to know if you, Justin and Marcos can help to ID some of their toys. Yeah, great, great segue, Grace. So I just want to show you guys this slide real quick. So remember, I started at the jump talking about these little tiny ones I use. This one in the middle, this yellow one, this is what I have identified as a Camptosaurus, our dino of the day. So when I get this package, there are 72 of them, 72 dinos, uh, well, not 72 individual ones, 72 total. 
There's like two to four of each one. And a lot of them, you can tell right away what it is. On the bottom left here, you see a triceratops uh, right down in the middle that's red and black. That's a styracosaurus with the multiple points. Um, but Camptosaurus is the one that is the least diagnostic features. Like it's very hard to identify what this is. And that's why I like to give it to friends as a challenge to try to find. And so speaking of challenges of identifying what these dinos are, I think Marcos, you and I are the perfect people to go around the Zoom room right now. And if you guys could start holding up your dinos, we're going to see if we can identify what species it is. And maybe Marcos, let's see if we can just pick a decade from, from which it's from. You think we could try that? Oh, yeah, sure. Let's see if, yeah. That, that, that might be easier for me. You might be able to get the names. All right. All right I'll, I'll focus on the species you yeah. focus on the decade. <laughs> Ashley's got one. I'm going to hold up. Ashley's here. I, would, I think that's a Dimetrodon, which is technically mm -hmm. not a dino. Marcos, any other thoughts? When do you I think that that is as well. Um, and that's a tough one. So what she's holding is something that still is produced today, like in a way that, that looks just like that in sort of cheaper uh, packs of dinosaurs that you can still buy in museum stores. So um, I don't know if that's a classic one from the 90s, I might guess. Is that close or is it even older, 80s? Not really sure. All right, we got to keep moving so we can see all these. Michael's got two here. Oh, these look old school. Yeah, it's a Triceratops and an Apatosaurus of sorts there. No, not an Apatosaurus. Okay. It's actually a Cediosaurus, and they're both old 70s uh, era toys from the British Museum of Natural History. These are like really old school. Very cool. All right, let's. Oh, I see one from Jenna Hartley here. What about this one? That's a big one. Oh, is that, that, that is also like some, that is clearly like, I want to say purchase now, like from today, is that? We well, can't read the belly, but <laughs> I wish we could. What species do you think that is, Marcos? Uh, is that a diplodocus or a, a not, not, the neck isn't thin enough. It's, not, it's a, some sort of a patasaur or some. Uh, yeah, hard to know exactly. Who else is holding up? Oh, Acacia's got, oh, this one's cute. I like this one. Uh, that's a Pachycephalosaurus, nice. right? Unless it's a sp specific, is that correct? Yeah. This is Pachycephalosaurus, yeah. Yeah, and probably from like, I'm gonna wager like in the last 10 years that that one was purchased. Cool, yeah, relatively recent. Uh, Car Carosaurus is holding up yeah. a, a multi, wow. Someone's got a whole. <laughs> oh my gosh, look how many dinosaurs are in the background. It's my fave. I love, look at all those beautiful dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, can we, can we look at Provinoraptors real quick? Wow, we got a Spinosaurus, and I think in a, maybe a T-Rex? These look, no, he's saying no. He's saying it's absolutely not. No, it's got ridges on its uh, head there, right? So. Oh, ridges now, yep. You see, it's a, like a weird, di it's not a Dilophosaurus. Um, no, I have something similar, but not, not quite. All right, we're gonna keep rolling because we gotta go through the images There's in so many. What are these guys on the right, Marcos? Do you know these things? <laughs> the guy, no, as a toy, those are really cool. They look like that's also like some sort of combo puzzle dinosaur. Um, is that something that you can take apart? I'm just curious from who's showing us those. I think they might fit together like a puzzle. We got to keep moving. Let's see, Bryn's got a couple here. Ooh, I like this. We got a raptor and a T-Rex, I think. Oh, yeah. those, those puzzles, they're 3D printed is what oh, you're 3D printed, it's awesome. So you can make yeah, your own they, dinosaur. they come toys. apart like a puzzle. Yeah. Oh, wait, I think I see another one. Kenner's Parker toy. Oh, I like that you've labeled them. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. So is that also a puzzle thing? You put together the pieces? Nice. That's awesome. Oh, there you oh. go. Just oh, my goodness. Decapitate. Yeah. Uh, Rob's got one here. All Rob, right. you, though, we, we can't do combos right now. We're moving. Yeah, what do you think about this one? This one looks pretty old, Marcos. It, it does look old. I mean, well, it's either old or it's retro, um, and it's totally. <laughs> is it a dragon? I don't know. Like, is that? It totally looks like some sort of. Um, I, I think it's a T Rex. A T Rex. That is a very. It's just like I don't know. I don't know. It's sort of like this one. I don't know if you can see my my screen. Like, I I have this one from South Korea that I have. Um, I'm like, it is kind of a, a stegosaur. I'm not quite sure. Hold that um, up. Hold that up again. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's, yeah. I love that. That's so Yeah, cool. but it, it comes from a brand called Dino World in um, South Korea. 
um, that I mean, like look at those eyes. Like it, it it's like a chameleon of some some sort, but exactly. sort of indistinguishable. Oh, look at that! That is a spinosaur, right? From like, uh, is that? Yeah, they're right? definitely a spinosaur of some variety. We're keeping moving. They have a whole family over here. We got a spinosaur, a brachiosaurus, maybe a T. Rex, a Triceratops. I got to go to my mom, who uh -oh. is currently holding up what a Dilophosaurus. Dilophosaurus. Yeah. Oh, yes, very correct. Okay, thanks, mom. Uh, is that is that all? I think that's most of our toys. Let's see. Let's hold up Natty's and Dino West before we get to our drawings. Wow, Marco, oh, is there? there we go. Is that like that's um, a Lego product, but or is that a um, mine? Oh wait, is that like a dinosaur that someone's writing inside that dinosaur body? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's Natty, a Lego. Oh, Natty, yeah, talk about it. You made it yesterday, um, right? Yeah, I, I built it yesterday. It's a Lego right. from Jurassic World. Yes. Yeah. All right, last, last ones here. Dino West, our champion from Dino or Not a Dino yesterday. Marco, so I'm going to put you to the test. Hadrosaur on one side, right? Is that, uh, and then. Wes, Wes, turn that to the side so we can see that head crest. There you go, yeah. Aerosaurol. First, 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 first off, love. yes, thank you. And that's your favorite, Dustin. And then uh, Pachycephalosaur of sorts, is that I right? Pachycephalosaur for sure. Cool. Oh, man, these were great. All right, I know these toys were great, but even more great are the drawings every day. So let's start going through our paleo art gallery. I'm gonna do these rapid fire and cycle through. As we're doing these, you guys remember, if you wanna support Dino 101, we do this literally every day. I am Dustin hyphen Groic at Venmo. Marcos, uh, be ready to be blown away. I know you're a big museum nerd just like me, but I pretty much guarantee you've never seen art quite like these. Hold up your, dino, your Camp to Source drawings. Natty, hold that down a little bit. Ooh, that one has a little All bit right. of in its back. Okay. All right. Speculative. Jada coming correct every day. There we go. Look at that. The colors. Great. Happy That's Marcos. not a toy. Happy Marcos. <laughs> Marcos, while we're going through these, I have a few more questions, actually. Um, uh -huh. So Catherine wants to know, why do you think the dinosaur toys are so popular and have a lasting impact? Um, so she works at a zoo, and they've started to have dinosaurs in their stores, I think. And she sees kids wanting the dinosaurs as souvenirs versus real animals. And she has mixed feelings about that. I think that dinosaurs allow for more imaginative play. So you can sort of open up your mind. I like that. Camp, oh, camp, camp. Uh, uh, so, so in terms of, that's why dragons are also popular. And sometimes you'll see those in the museum stores as well. And unicorns, like they, there's magical qualities to like dragons and unicorns that also exist with dinosaurs for role play. So let's not forget that toys, a good toy allows you to do some type of role or action play um, compared to like, you know, a puzzle, which is all the act of that is to like complete it and then you're done. So to me, I, I, I think that seeing dinosaurs in zoos is not um, something that's going to go away because that, um, you kind of know what a tiger does. Like, you know what it's going to do. Um, you might give it some, some life, like from Lion King, because you've watched that as a particular property. But like a dinosaur is just more open-ended. I love all the, uh, the oh. camp themes for the Camptosaurus. Uh, Marcos, do you know anything about the Alley Oop comic strip from the 1950s? They had a pet dinosaur named Dinny, um, and it was the first depiction that Bruce ever saw. Uh, do you know if there were any toys made for this? I don't. That's a great thing that you just sent me on an a internet spiral on uh, right after this meeting. Uh, so Alley Oop had a pet dinosaur. I, I will have to look at that. These are so good. I love all the, the camping themes. Uh, I think my favorite thing about camping is that it's intense. You, you get it? You, you guys, I, I, uh, I, I, yes. okay. I was waiting for the ruckus applause. For Adela, that. that's so beautiful. I love it. I like the purple. That's good. Love it. Thank you. And, oh, Stephen is here from the National Museum of Natural History in DC. What's up, Stephen, for joining us again. Campton, I like this. We got one from Tony here. We're coming to the end. Ooh, Larry and Lucy. I like that you guys have put them in pairs a lot today. That's great. Uh, last but not least, M, taking a page out of Agus's book, uh, doing the post-it note drawings. Love it. So Marcos, we have come just about to the end of our time together today. Do you have any final parting words to share with the group? Uh, and how can people get a hold of you and come and say hi and visit you? One day. Uh, well, right now you can't come and visit. Uh, but uh, you know, as as many of our museums are closed, but you 
visit the Monshire, we have a great online program. So if you're looking for amazing activities to do at home, we have something called Monshire at Home, where we release awesome um, educational packages like throughout the week. They're very doable. Like you can actually do these at home. Um, so I highly recommend them. This week is all about density, like density. Like well, you want to learn about density? We have a great one on eggs that we did um, with the baby, you know, that's like contemporary dinosaurs. Uh, that we have today that live in people's houses. So um, so check out Monshire at home. Uh, Dustin said you could always like hit me up on my Instagram, which is kind of hilarious right now. It's a lot of pictures of my cat Oreo um, and uh, long walks in Lonely White River Junction. But a lot of the times it's me going on a lot of fun museum adventures. What is the, Mon is it just monshire.org to find that stuff? Monshire.org, yep. Put that in the chat as well. Awesome. Yeah. Marcos, thank you so much for joining us today. I've learned a ton about the history and the psychology behind dinosaur toys. And I think that makes for a really good segue to what we are going to talk about tomorrow. Finally, you guys, tomorrow, Jurassic Park. The one, the only, the uh, producer of See Jurassic Right, the podcast, Stephen Ray Morris is going to join us. And him and I are going to break down some of our absolute favorite and maybe contentious scenes from the, the really the only Jurassic uh, movie that matters, the original Jurassic Park. So tomorrow, noon, every single day, you guys know this, me, Stephen Ray Morris, we're talking about Jurassic Park. I'm probably gonna watch tonight. Make a of what we're talking about. Thanks again, Marcos. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I don't care if you guys are trying to find change to get bus fare to go to the Monshire or simply reaching deep down in your pockets to get change to put in the Moldorama to produce your very own plastic toy, old school dino. Never stop digging. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Jurassic Park with Stephen A. Morris. Peace. Bye, everyone.